Hi, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Jason Key. Uh, I'm with SB Grid here at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're lucky to have Lance Westerhoff joining us from Quantum Bio today. So Lance is uh, going to be talking to us about uh, using semi-empirical quantum mechanics to refine uh, structures in Phoenix. So Lance, are you there? Maybe muted. Let me unmute you here. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, uh, Jason. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everyone, uh, certainly for uh, joining us today. Uh, uh, certainly along the way, if there's any questions or comments or anything, uh, I guess from what Jason tells me, he'll be able to uh, to take note of those and, and let me know. So I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, so we'll co cover a couple things. Uh, key background information, of course, uh, just a little bit about the theory. I'll, I'll focus more on you know kind of how we did things within Phoenix and really trying to do this discussion or have this discussion from a Phoenix perspective. Um, we've, we'll talk about some key, just some structures to give you some examples of some of thing, the things we've done, maybe some of the things that, uh, that new understanding that we've been able to drive. Uh, a new and improved structure and what that really gives for us, especially from a drug discovery uh, component or perspective, uh, which is kind of where we come from or and where most of our clients come from. Uh, I'll then talk uh, touch on a little bit of something that we've we've been talking a lot more about in some other venues, um, and that is how these better structures and what we can do with these better methods can actually give us an understanding of uh, even things like protonation states, flip states, you know, those sorts of things that uh, you know, in conventional refinement tends to be a problem, but since we're using uh, physics-based methods, we're, we're able to glean that information. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uni uh, some usage notes, both from a command line perspective, and that's straight out of Phoenix Refine. So if you're already using Phoenix Refine uh, with a couple little switches, you're able to uh, switch on our, our implementation as well. Um, and then I'll have a quick little thing just about uh, our Mo, Mo plugin or our GUI plugin, which, which is available through Mo. So I guess the, the the big question, of course, would be why we want to do these sorts of things and why we did we go down this path. Uh, you know, this right here is is not really unusual for anyone. Everybody, of course, understands this uh, more than likely. Is that a good bit of the the PDB and this and then the the ligand structures that are within the PDB uh, tend to have some pretty significant flaws. And some of those flaws are things that we can we can address. Uh, through better methods. Some of them are just simply they've been placed wrong or put in some way or, or something like that. Uh, those those sorts of question or issues tend to be uh, beyond the scope. We're, we're more focused on from a refinement perspective, and that is uh, that once you actually had it within the, the active site, uh, did it actually refine down to a, a reasonable level? Did it have a nice low energy, uh, a, a low ligand strain? Uh, and of course, then are, are you actually being able to capture the, the proper interactions that are going on within the active site? Those are, that's more of the problem that we're, we tend to focus on from a refinement perspective. So kind of where this this comes from, and of course, this of course would be very old hat for everybody on the call. Uh, if you look at the whole refinement toolbox, you're going everything from protein crystallization all the way down to the repository, whether that's a PDB or a corporate database or an internal database of some sort. And there's a lot of those steps along the way. And of course, a lot of the folks here understand these steps probably more intimately than, than most. And that would be anything from, uh, you know, certainly if you're if you're collecting that data, trying to integrate that data, trying to understand where that that structure or that model may may reside within that data. But there's this nice little step here along the way of of, of structure refinement, and that's where computational methods really begin to to have the, uh, some really great impact, where you can break that structure refinement down into your restraint library or SIF file, of course, what everybody tends to use. Uh, or if it's a uh, electromechanics type of method, if you're if you're looking at atom types, those sorts of things, uh, all that's within a restraint library of some sort or a SIF library of some sort. You generate a set of gradients, and then finally you, you run that through a minimizer. In the case of, of of Phoenix, that's LPFGS. Of course, you can use some other minimizers along the way as well. But of course, it's not uh, it's it's certainly not controversial to say that within conventional refinement. Uh, you tend to be missing a lot of a lot of uh, interactions or a lot of key physics, and that'd be based on electrostatics, polarization, charge transfer, hydrogen bonding, so on and so forth. So these things, whether they're intra or intermolecular uh, types of, uh, of of interactions, tend to be completely missing uh, from the functional. And so what we can do, and of course, on top of that, we we're, we're also there's there tends to be this reliance when you're building a SIF file. On, uh, you're relying on the unbound confirmation to generate that SIF file. 
So what we've been able to do then is if you replace that with a functional, in this case, a QM functional or a, QM, a QMMM functional with an MM uh, uh, component within, uh, within the tool as well, uh, in that case, we can just very simply uh, at least um, um, uh, you know, co conceptually simply, uh, we can remove the concept of, of, re of, of these SIF files or these basic restraints and put in place the, the, an energy functional, which is again ge generating a set of gradients, which the, again go through a, the same minimizer. And so that's kind of what's nice about using something like Phoenix, where we can uh, very nicely use, still use that same L LBFGS minimizer but we're just basically substituting our uh, gradients in place of the gradients that would have naturally been there. So if you kind of think about what what a more complete functional tends to mean, or what what where, where we're perspective or where our perspective is coming from, uh, you kind of have this this com continuum within the the uh, a computational chem a chemistry uh, uh, perspective where you have everything from restraints on the left side, which that would be and, and conventional refinement in Phoenix, Buster, RefMac, whatever, what have you. Uh, they tend to have very rudimentary understanding of torsions or bond lengths or bond angles. In fact, that's actually how the, the, the entire thing is based. It's just, uh, just on those terms. Uh, you have some ligand specific atom types within the SIF, some target values, some uh, the concept of riding protons comes into play as well. But again, as we already said, we're missing a, a lot of the physics. So if you wanted to, you could, you could throw all of this out and, co and completely jump around to the other side where you have ab initio and DFT. Uh, in that case, you're talking about extremely advanced understanding of, of basically it runs the entire gamut depending upon your, your Hamiltonian, your size, your basis, minimal parameters, which makes it nice. You're usually just working on elements. Uh, but of course, your, your expense tends to be a problem where that could take anything from, from days to weeks to well, to years if you if you if you go completely way up the, the 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 continuum. So what we did is we found somewhere right in the middle here, where if we're looking at expense, we're looking at something at minutes to hours for semi-empirical QM. Uh, you tend to have a very advanced understanding of what what is going on within the act, uh, the active site from electrostatics, polarization, and charge transfer perspective. Uh, you have a some level of understanding of dispersion and hydrogen bonding. And a key there is, is also that, uh, that all the elements are the same. So we have a carbon, uh, it's one carbon and only one carbon. We don't have 20 different carbons or 30 different carbons. Uh, same thing with nitrogen, oxygen, uh, protons, so on and so forth. And so this makes it, a, a, you know, again, it's a really nice uh, middle ground where we don't necessarily have uh, the, the complete full basis uh, uh, that we may have with high end ab initio, but then we can also get it done in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and again, usually in minutes if your if your QM region is set appropriately. So again, to just to, to 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 finalize in terms of how the, this is all put together with with uh, Phoenix is again, if you have this concept of gradients that were were generally based upon restraints, we've now been able to place the these divcon gradients in that place. And but we're still using density gradients, and so it's still a refinement. It's not a QM optimization. It's still a QM refinement. So you're still using your, your experimental density uh, just as you always would. So as far as Phoenix is concerned, it's just reading in the MTZ file as it, as it always has. Go th down through Python, through LBF, uh, uh, LBFGS minimizer. And again, the, the nice thing about this is that, that if you look at these blue points, this is where you're, you're replacing one with the other. And again, we share a, a common uh, infrastructure here where we have this concept of Python bindings. And so it makes it very nice and easy for us to, to, to pop these two together. And in fact, as, as, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, if it sees or Phoenix sees uh, a DivCon within the environment, it'll automatically flip on the right switches to allow you to be able to, to, to just use DivCon as you would at any other time. And so if we can think about then that there's, there's basically two different concepts or two different approaches that we can use. Uh, we can do a full refinement, and that would actually be applying that semi-empirical QM method to the entire protein, uh, which could be very much useful. If again, if you have several different regions or several different areas, sometimes it's just easier to to, to run the full QM. I, I, likewise, if you have something that's very symmetric or symmetrically related, uh, again from a full QM re, uh, perspective, you can do that. But we also, uh, of course, support the concept or the idea of region refinement. And that that you can, at that point, drill down just right to uh, the active site region 
uh, anything from you know a few angstroms out, zero angstroms out if you just want to use the ligand, uh, all the way out to five, six, seven, ten, twenty angstroms out from from the uh, the QM region or regions. If you have multiple ligands or multiple cofactors, you can choose all of them, and then it will automatically expand out that QM region appropriately. So so schematically, you can kind of think of this as you have this ligand, you have that main QM region, you have a buffer QM region, which, which effectively allows you to buffer. Um, as the name implies, between that QM per perspective uh, or point of view and the stereochemical restraints. And that buffer region is, is actually, it's, it's kind of a, a neat way of handling it where the, the XYZ coordinates of those atoms are set by the stereochemical restraints. However, those atoms are still included within the QM calculation. And so that those, uh, any sort of perturbations or effects of the stereochemistry will actually percolate down into the QM and vice versa. Now, more recently, and this is beyond the scope of the conversation today, but it's something that you can exper experiment with as well, is we've also implemented a, uh, a more of an onion method or a conventional QMMM method where you can have, again, a QM region or more than one QM region. And then the rest of this, instead of these being stereochemical restraints, you can flip on an amber function of force field or a uh, uh, sometime down the road, we may put in some other force fields as well. So again, schematically, if you if you think about it, uh, conventionally or or originally, you had this idea of extra refinement where you, you have this this total energy which is which is broken down into your energy associated with your X-ray gradients and your X and your energy associated with your restraints or your geometric restraints. Uh, we've then now taken that and re and basically just replaced that one point, so you still have that same concept or that same master equation but instead of them being restraints, now it's QMMM or onion. So that's great. So now we have this way of doing a, uh, uh, you know, a QM or a QMMM or a QM stereochemical restraint mixed method, but what does that get us or why would we want to do that? So one way to think about it, and, and this, this one happened to come up where, uh, you know, we, we happen to come along what would be considered a pathological uh, uh, SIF file, where this again is just a distributed monolith database. Um, it's something that, uh, that for this particular PDB file, for whatever reason, uh, they there, were, there were some problems within the SIF. And again, you can kind of see this where you had this 1.6 angstroms, 1.62 angstroms uh, for this carbon-carbon bond. Uh, all we did, we didn't actually have to, we could have, of course, gone through that SIF library and figured out what those bond lengths and bond angles should have been. But the beauty of it was we didn't have to. We didn't, we didn't even have to do that. We just took the, the structure, the PDB structure as it stood. Uh, and, and actually, as far as Phoenix is concerned, it's still read in that same SIF file. But instead of, or, or as it's running along, instead of it using that SIF file or those gradients associated with that SIF file, all it did was it flipped on the QM. Uh, calculation and automatically it went down to a lower strain from a very high 557k cals down to a, a more reasonable 16, 17k cals of strain. Um, you're still you're getting, of course, a little bit better uh, real space correlation coefficient and so on. But the nice thing was it was it's something that now if you would hand this down the line or hand this to a computational chemist or a med chemist or or if you even just kind of want to understand what's going on within the active side a little bit better. Now you know that these these problems or these perturbations in that in this yellow structure are no longer there, and now they've refined out and become lower energy. So to, to understand a little bit more about what's going on within the active site, we use this uh, this tool here. It's in this particular case, it's in Mo, but there are other applications out there, of course, that do these sorts of uh, ligand active site diagrams. Uh, we were able to put 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 that together and say, well, okay, well, what, what do we get? Are we able to rescue or that concept of rescue of hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, met, uh, metals, aryan, so on and so forth? Can we actually look at these things and understand if we if we move these, these, these tiny movements, both in the, again, it's both in the ligand and the active site, can we see these, these bonds strengthening or weakening depending upon how strong they are or how, how strong they should be within the active site? So we think of this particular structure and this this one as as a zinc in it. So that's a, as, again, it's a really good example. It's something that has a metal. It, those uh, we we don't use again. We throw out the concept of of having any sort of uh, link restraints or um, uh, 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 any sort of sphere restraints. All of those have now been been removed, and instead we now fall right down to whatever the Hamiltonian or the QM tells us. 
in this case, this uh, this this nicely locked in the the uh, the, the histidines locked in very well, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. And of course, we end up with a, a little bit lower strain, a good bit better uh, 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 agreement with density, which was nice. But I think the the nice thing, or the key thing that we could we could start looking at, were was a, was that we actually started to to look at these interactions or understand these interactions from a better perspective. So in this case, if you look at the uh, uh, the interaction energy, this PDB of, is a ninety a negative ninety k cal per mole from the PDB structure, or that's the original structure, just as it was. We refined it, went down a significant amount in terms of the the uh, interaction energy, but where we, it became really interesting was where we looked at these again, this concept of false positives or false negatives when it comes to hydrogen bonds, metals, ionics, arenes, and so on. And in this case, we had the, this, this false negative, which would be, a, a, again, a miss. So this would be something that in the original uh, uh, PDB file, it was missing. Uh, this would be what we consider a rescue. We, so we rescued a hydrogen bond. Again, that would probably be this, uh, excuse me, this one right here. And we were able to, uh, to of course, look at uh, some better metal interactions, uh, the ionic interactions, of course, as well. And, of course, you had some better stacking uh, that, that occurred in this case. So we can see that, that we were able to now rescue these, these interactions. But what was surprising when we started running a lot of these was that we're all, we also had the concept of false positives. And these were cases where in the original, in the original refinement, you thought you had a, an interaction but that interaction actually goes away or it, or it disappears. And what that means is that interaction, either A shouldn't be there or B was pretty weak to begin with. And you probably should be, again, manipulating that ligand in some other way if you want to want to get that interaction back again. Did the same thing with a macrocycle. Again, macrocycles tend to be, be problematic where you have this, this very long, very flexible chain and it can fit, uh, or, excuse me, ring that, you, that they can fit within that active site a lot of different ways. Uh, you, and of course, you, within the density, it fits a ton of different ways. You, you know, uh, this is kind of why you have to use restraints to begin with. Again, uh, kind of a 2.8 angstrom, not all that great, but it's also not uh, that all far off from, from what people use uh, in their drug discovery uh, uh, paradigms. And so in that case, what, what we saw is that we could fit that ring within that density many, many, many different ways. So, uh, so by, by running the refinement, we can now refine it down to a lower strain energy. In this case, again, from 650, uh, or 665 kcal all the way down to 57, 58 kcal, which again was a, a significant uh, improvement. Real space correlation uh, also improved. Uh, then when we started looking at the interactions and, and again, a breakdown of all those interactions, in this case, the original PDB file had a positive interaction energy, went down to a, to a negative interaction. So not like great, but it's certainly better uh, than, a, than a positive. And so now we can say that this, this, these models are actually more, more accurate or they're applying or, or uh, finding the interactions within the active site better. And again, in this case, you had a, uh, a, a missing hydrogen bond in the original that we were able to, to save or to rescue. Uh, and then we also had uh, some false positives in the original where you thought you had some interactions. So you actually thought you'd build a macro cycle that, that satisfied a set of interactions. And in reality, it didn't. It, 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 they, they shifted out a little bit. They were not as, as strong as you thought they were. So, so it's great that we can, we can now understand uh, these, these interactions and we can understand these, these ligands in a much better, uh, from a much better perspective. But can we use that to understand a little bit more about protonation states? Because of course, that's that's all that tends to be the problem, right? In in X-ray crystallography, we, we don't we don't quote unquote see protonation. So can we drop that those protons away, or excuse me, can we actually add protons, not drop them? Can we add protons uh, that are a little more accurate? Can we figure and say that this is a better interaction than this one over over on the other side? So we so this this came from a really nice set of ideas that again and, and some discussions with our clients where they said well okay go back to neutron diffraction uh, you know there's there's a few neutron diffraction structures I think there's probably about 80 or so in the entire PDB can we take a couple of those and we can can we look at them and now using X-ray can we uh, can we make the appropriate changes or we can can we actually protonate these in, in a way that fits that neutron diffraction. And so in this case, we said, well, okay, so, so since we don't have 
uh, since QM doesn't conceptualize bonds as rigid sticks, we should be able to see some sort of uh, see a concept of a, of a shared proton, maybe a proton within or between two amino acids, uh, or, or amino acid and a ligand. Um, the other another hypothesis, since we're since we're very sensitive to protonation state, different states should impact the structure. And so, in this case, if uh, for this neutron diffraction, it was sh shown that we had a neutral arginine. Can, can we see slight little differences within that arginine based upon protonation state? And so if we can model these in, in some way and, and, and then compare back to density, can we understand that this is the correct one or not? So in this particular simulation, we use Mo for the protonator. Uh, presumably you could use our ready set, which is Phoenix's protonator, uh, or any number of other protonators for that, for that matter. Uh, we then manipulate those protonation states as per the neutron diffraction possibilities. And that would be, again, a neutron or positive one arginine, uh, uh, whether or not that proton was there to begin with in that ligand, so on and so forth. We then challenge Phoenix DivCon at the original uh, uh, 1.3 angstroms. And then we also truncated back. And the reason why we truncated back in this case was that well, we wanted to see if, you know, how important or at what level does density start, uh, does the effects of density start deteriorating? Can we still see it at lower, um, uh, lower resolutions? Now we fully recognize that a truncated structure is not the same as a natural 1.8 or 1.6 angstrom structure. What it is is where, where the, or the issue tends to be that if you go through and try to find a very high uh, resolution structure and a very low resolution structure, remember pH matters. And so if these are crystallized at a different pH or if they are crystallized in some other way, uh, that will significantly impact what your protonation states are. And so, in, so the only way we can do this really well is, is try to remove a, a variable or a set of variables. In this case, we did it through truncation. And that variable, of course, being the experiment. Um, and then finally, we compared these X-ray uh, results back to neutron. In this case, again, we see this, uh, these, these neutron examples uh, where if you look at the, uh, it, it is a shared proton between this glue and this, this ligand. Uh, we, if you look at the conventional or the restraint-based X-ray, again at 1.3 angstrom, well, that's a, that proton is going to be wherever you put it to begin with. Uh, you, you can't. You, there isn't a concept of bond making or bond breaking um, in restraint-based uh, structures. So again, you could of course go go and put, go into that SIF file and say, well, okay, I instead of that 0.89 angstroms, I want to set that to be a 1.37 angstroms. But then at that point, you need to know what the, at an a priori basis, you need to know what the results should look like. And so what we did was we said, well, okay, let's go ahead and just, just protonate it as, as is in the PDB, um, allow that re refinement to occur. And again, of course, it came up with whatever was set in the SIF, in that case, 0.889. When we flipped off the SIF and we, uh, we flipped on QM, in that case, very nicely, the proton actually shifted right out into the into the space or into the gulf between uh, again that glue and that ligand, and it came out to actually be exactly the same, or almost exactly the same at 1.337 and 1.2 again 1.37 uh, 1.21, and so it, it was kind of nice to see that where it it not only uh, shifted it out but it actually did end up coming out to be uh, pretty much exactly where where it should be again according to the neutron diffraction. When we truncate that back. Uh, you know, again, the same sorts of things happen. And, and again, you kind of, uh, uh, you kind of expect this because uh, when you get to this level, when you get to the, the protonation state level, uh, at, at that point, the QM is really kind of taken over. And so it doesn't really matter uh, if you are talking about a high resolution or a low resolution, uh, you would expect them to pretty, pretty much lock in. You're going to see a little bit of shifting around of, you know, heavy atom structure and things like that. But in general, these are going to be pretty much the same. Depend, irregardless of how high your, or high, how low re, your resolution is. So the same idea for the arginine, where you had an arginine uh, 52, uh, again, in the protonated case or the unprotonated case. And at first blush, this looks exactly the same, right? I mean, you have, uh, you know, within the, within the space, you can see this nice splitting going on, very nice over here, and you see it all the same, the same, the same. But then when you look a little more closely, you can see this, this little bit of negative density over here in the protonated case, but not the unprotonated case. And so again, and that, and that held whether or not you had it the natural 1.3 angstrom or back down to the, uh, to the 1.8. And again, it kind of is expected with, uh, uh, within uh, a, a restraint-based method, you don't really see a whole lot of a difference. They, there isn't very much in the way of a shift. 
why? Because that shift does isn't necess- isn't just within the restraints, but it's also would be in the in the interactions between all these different species within the site. So again, since we're using QM, since we're using this not just on the the structure alone, but also its environment, you're capturing all of those interactions between that arginine and everything else around it. And so if you if you now made uh, change something from a negative to a positive or from a positive to a neutral, you're going to see those sorts of, of electrostatics coming into play. So now if you as, can want to think about it, then our schematic grows, our schematic components of X-ray refinement grows. It's not just the data and it's not just the chemical functional. Those are extremely important. That master equation still comes into play. But your your start, your setup also becomes important. What was your protonation states? What were your flip states? Or is your ligand at least some semblance of, of, of at the correct point within the, the, the structure? Um, and, and when you bring all of those together, then that that really equates to your X-ray model. And, and at first blush, again, this might look look uh, a little more daunting, right? You're saying, well, okay, now you now you've you've made it more complex. And it, but in reality, what you've now done is you said all of these things become important. So now they become something that I can use to decide, is this the correct model or is this not? And so in reality, that this is a big benefit where in the past, protonation states and whatnot didn't really matter all that much. Now it does. And now we can say, OK, if I made a change up here that, and that made a significant change to my model, that means that change is probably important. And from a, from a drug discovery perspective or a med chemistry perspective, all of that becomes extremely uh, extremely important for you to, to understand what you're going to build next for your your uh, uh, for for your 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 uh, uh, drug discovery process. So now we'll start talking a little bit about uh, your usage notes. Then um, I'll touch on a few conclusions. Uh, I, I'm told by by uh, Jason this would be involved uh, or this is available within your programs directory. Uh, within there, uh, this is a Linux based version. Uh, in the not too distant future, we'll have a Mac version for you guys as well. Um, and in that case, then you should you'll be able to run DivCon just again, just as anyone else would if they would download or or would have downloaded the software from us. It's now available through SB Grid. And on top of that, there's also a license file that's within there that allows you uh, to to use that. And I should note one one of the points that I I, I should note at the beginning as well, and I did note in the uh, in the abstract. Uh, this is right now being licensed to SB Grid for uh, users that are using this for um, academic uh, nonprofit research. Uh, if you're a part of an industrial organization or an industrial consortium, uh, in that case, that you you should come to us and get an industrial license or a commercial license. Uh, that would also include if you're doing this as a service for someone that 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 uh, as uh, for a commercial and uh, uh, player. At that point, then you should use a commercial license. So this would be for a true nonprofit research. Uh, we're giving that to you guys for uh, uh, for free. So here's uh, first off some common questions uh, uh, that that tend to come up a lot when we first uh, discuss this with folks. Um, is uh, does Phoenix DivCon support uh, multiple QM regions? Again, that could be if you had a cofactor over here and a and a ligand over there, or if you have multiple copies of the same ligand within the structure, what, what or what have you? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's it's you can have multiple QM regions. Uh, it automatically takes care of if those are if they're close enough together and within the same region effectively. Again, with our buffer regions, it'll bring them all together and it'll just it'll just it'll automatically take care of that. If they're separate, it'll it's that's just fine as well. It'll it'll it use those as separate pieces. Um, and in actually, in actuality, it, it parallelizes even better. So if you're using parallelism or multiple processors, and we'll get to that in a second, uh, that becomes really important for 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 parallelism. Can you treat uh, alternative atoms? Well, I, that one's yes and yes and no. In the QM region, it's it's no. Uh, QM is 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 at this stage. Uh, there isn't a clear way of having the concept of of having multiple copies of the same same exact atom or the same exact atom being at multiple positions. Uh, QM doesn't really allow that. So the, uh, if it's somewhere else it w- within your restraints, that's fine. In, in the restraint region, uh, it's, it's all fine and well to use a, uh, to, to have alternative atoms. We are exploring different ways of doing this with QM, um, both from a theoretical perspective and at the very least doing an averaging uh, with with several different uh, poses and do, trying to do that automatically. Um, it's just something we're exploring for later on this year. 
do you need to pertinate the structure? And that's that I hope I've made pretty clear that yes, absolutely. Uh, all the atoms are important in phys physics-based methods. Uh, I'd also recommend that you go through and model build or, or Rotomer uh, explore or sample uh, for any sort of um, uh, any anything that 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 you're seeing, or or I should say, not seeing within the within the structure. So if you have a an active site or 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 anywhere close to the active site where you are missing a side chain, uh, the best bet is try to model build a, a set of rotomers in. Uh, go through. You know, if you want to set your occupancy to zero, that's all fine and good. Uh, the key is that physics matters, and if these things are are off, that that will impact you. What about symmetry? I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Uh, yes, you, can, you know, crystal graphic symmetry is supported. All it, uh, all you do or all it does underneath is is Phoenix passes to us uh, what the symmetry operator is. We go through and we take care of uh, replicating that out and doing that again from a uh, from a QM perspective. It does have to be the full QM structure, so it would have to be the entire protein. Uh, but it it is definitely usable and and extremely useful. Um, it actually speeds up convergence significantly. Um, both QM convergence and refinement convergence when you're using the full QM and using uh, crystal graphic symmetry. It's really kind of neat to watch. Um, do, do we uh, do any pre-refinement sampling and docking? One of the things that, that oftentimes, and this, this is something to make very clear, uh, no, we are not redocking the structure in the meantime. If you have a couple different possible uh, states, possible different flip states, or possible different uh, 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 different possibilities for the uh, or, or docking uh, binding modes for that ligand. Uh, in all those cases, uh, you you should just treat them as, refi as separate refinements. We are not doing any sort of uh, um, uh, docking or redocking of the ligand uh, beforehand. So what you're going to see is at the, at the end is is coordinates that are very close to what you started with. The key is now they're much low, much more low energy structures and you're actually capturing interactions in a much more uh, rigorous manner than what you had before. That being said, uh, in, the, in the not too distant future, this is actually already available in our full package in, uh, when, if you're using Mo. Um, it'll do tautomer and protomer sampling. Um, we're also now adding rotomer sampling as well. And so that is coming very soon. Uh, that's that'll be completely automated for you know within the package. It would go through try different tautomers, protomers, um, uh, rotomers at, at, at all during the all just prior to the refinement, and actually then give you an understanding of which one is the correct one or not, and which one's not. If you are interested in doing this now, uh, again, if you have have Mo, it's it's it is something that that you can flip on. Um, just uh, reach out to me, and I'll I'll let you know how to do it. So what are the opportunities? What what applications really uh, would would fit best for this? Uh, I, you know, obviously you could use it for anything, uh, but the key things that really makes uh, where this is most strength, or or you're going to see the most impact. Um, for one, try to use it as early as possible. One of the things we've seen is if you make some a priori assumptions uh, about refinement, about your SIF structure or whatnot, you can put yourself in the in the, in a wrong well or an incorrect energy well. And so you try to you do it as, as early as possible. Uh, of course, if you want to, do, uh, it's always good to do some some initial cleanup using refinement uh, as you always would. But the key is you want to try to do this as, as early as you possibly can in order to save your your effort. Because what happens is it takes longer for it to pull out of the, the wrong well and put it into the right well. Covalently bound ligands, of course, uh, cofactors, metal ions. Uh, obviously, the, that's where it's going to come in. Uh, coordination spheres, I mentioned earlier. Uh, confirmation and flexible molecules, these become very difficult to get, and this in odd chemistry, get, they become difficult to get SIF files that, um, that, that, that correctly capture that structure. Why? Because the, the, the protein can have such a big impact. Um, you know, they, they can, can actually shift around these things a whole lot in ways that the SIF didn't really pick up. Hydrogen transfers, I, I touched on that earlier. Uh, unknown protonation states where two or more states can be mutually explored in density. Uh, what that means is if you had a couple different states, you're not sure which one, just like I had done with that arginine case, run those two or three or four refinements, figure out which one fits best and, and, and go for it. And of course, multiple regions as well. So if you want to if you want to think about then metrics to consider in this whole thing and, and decide whether or not you're getting better structures or or uh, structures that are more um, 
indicative of what's going on. Obviously, looking at an agreement with density, you could look at real space correlation coefficient. You could use, uh, we have a method that's originally based upon uh, Ian Tick, some, Ian, some of Ian Tickle's work where we're using a, a Z, Z score of the, the, the difference density. Uh, that tends to work extremely well. Um, you, you can look at a, a pocket ligand interaction analysis, um, um, interaction energies as well. So those are all outputted uh, optionally by the method. Um, and then, of course, ligand strain actually does come out um, just by default uh, through the run. And so for every single ligand or every single center of, a, uh, of, of, a, uh, of any sort of selection, uh, that will automatically come out as a, as, a, as a value. And you can look at that and say, this is what my, my ligand strain was before, and this is what it is after. So to, to touch on CPU time requirements, uh, it is very parallel happy or very parallel friendly. Uh, the more, more processors, the more threads you can throw at this thing, the better. Um, and that's especially true if your QM region is very large. And so you'll see this if you kind of go down through, the, through this, uh, this uh, uh, graph where you have, again, the time versus um, the, the residue count. As you approach uh, one residue, um, your parallelism actually goes down pretty quickly. And that, and that you kind of expect, right? Because if you're looking at parallel, paralleling or, or threading, uh, all of your different residues are running on their own thread. The more threads you give it, the more it's going to be able to treat more residues. Um, if you have only one residue, it's not going to parallel, well, parallelize very well at all. But again, you're also just talking about a, a few minutes for a run in that case as well. But as you go higher and higher and higher, or larger and larger and larger in ter terms of your QM region, in this case, uh, 93 residues. Uh, the, in, in the case of 93 residues, it'll it'll be what about almost twice as fast. And so it is something that becomes uh, uh, that that paralyzes extremely well again for larger and larger proteins or larger and larger regions. So how how does how does one go about using this within Phoenix .refine? Obviously, we're assuming that you've already protonated it. Uh, you can use uh, Ready Set, of course, uh, or you can use Mo if you have a if you have Mo available. You could most likely use um, uh, Schrodinger's tools or or yeah, even Tripost's tools or or whomever. I mean, it really uh, protonation becomes extremely important. But the the idea of of actually just generating protonation states uh, that's that's something that that a lot of different tools would do, and including very soon hours as well. Uh, so for for uh, if you wanted to look at this from an advanced perspective, uh, all you're providing it is again from a from a Phoenix is th this again is how Phoenix works. You're providing it with a PDB file, an MTZ file, and then of course your SIF file. As I mentioned earlier, we don't actually use that SIF, but Phoenix you needs that SIF in order to to get past any sort of error trapping. And so you still need to provide it. It doesn't really matter what data is in it, however, as long as Phoenix is happy. So your QB lib, you're going to flip that on. That's turning on the, the quantum bio library. And then choosing what method, you could choose PM6, AM1, PM3, so on and so forth. And then, of course, what your selection, selected region is and how big your, your regions should be, whether it's three angstroms for the main region and two and a half angstroms for the, for the uh, buffer. Now, if you want to simplify it, you could, you, and, if, and you say, hey, look, there's, there's either one CLR or a whole bunch of CLRs, so a bunch of uh, one residue or a whole bunch of uh, ligands. Uh, all you have to do is you have to say turn it on and then say I want to select the CLR, and it will automatically if there's a bunch of them, it will it'll string them all together. It'll all take care of that underneath for you. Now, if you wanted to, if you weren't conf confident or or careful with your protonation states, uh, uh, or excuse me, your your protonator tool. Uh, you could also use we we provide a script. It's uh, it's just a, a basically just a wrapper script. It's a Perl script uh, that goes through it again, takes that PDB file, structure factor file, uh, the same sort of selection again. In this case, you could simplify it, just say res name and drop out res ID and not, and and the chain, um, or you could you could you could pick them all. Uh, it'll automatically go through. Then in this case, use ready set. If you had Mo, it would use Mo, so on and so forth. And while, when it's all said and done, when it's I, I finally run through through the uh, you know again on the command line, uh, when it's all finally run, your 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 PDB file or your final PDB file will also appear with with certain key information. At the at the top of the file, up where Phoenix provides its Phoenix specific information or its Phoenix specific data, 
uh, we've added, a, uh, this was a request from several clients where they said, hey, look, you're, you're already generating uh, all these char this charge information inherently underneath. Can you provide that those charges for me or those partial charges for me? Yes, we can. So we, we now we add, we add uh, a set of remarks that, that have, here's the atom name, residue name, residue ID chain, and there's your, your, um, your partial charge as per PM6. That's everything that's above that, this, this line will be of course re removed when, if you're going to dep uh, uh, deposit it. Below this line that is, is included. And so this would be actually part of the deposition and we're making, and we have worked with uh, the P2B to make sure that, uh, that this is an acceptable um, set of information, set of remarks that will be included within the, the P2B. In that case, again, it's the, here's the, the program, here's the reference, the associated reference, uh, what the method was that was used in this case, PM6. Um, and what, how big the, the, the regions were and, of course, the, the strain. So in, in this case, that way you can go back through. It includes also what the build number was. You could go back through and you could replicate this information, which, of course, is a key part, part of any P2B run. Finally, if you have Mo, uh, we also have, we do provide a Mo uh, dialog box as well. And in that case, that, that, of course, you can, now that you've seen how the setup goes from a command line basis, it works very similarly where you're going to choose what the SIF file is, going to do the structure preparation. In, the, in this case, that could be modeling rotomers, that could be modeling protonation states, so on and so forth. You're going to turn on region refinement. It automatically selects um, the, the amino acid um, and any sort of cofactors, in this case, the zincs. Uh, it also accidentally got, got that GOL, and of course, that, that, that'd be something you could very easily remove. Um, the QM region, how big, big you want it to be, the main region, and then, of course, the buffer, and so on and so forth. This automatically also calculates any sorts of sizes and things like that as well. So what happens if you need more help? The, the, uh, uh, what, as you guys are getting started using this within the, uh, the, the SB grid system, uh, our support email is, is by far the best. That's, that you'll get the, the entire team. Um, that'll, be da that'll be down, of course, to me, but then also our crystallographers and our software developers. And so in that, that way, if you send out that, that email, it'll go to everyone and, and, and someone will respond very quickly. Uh, we, of course, have our product page. Um, there are frequently asked questions page. We'll, we'll give the questions that I just answered plus a whole bunch more that, that come up a whole lot. Uh, tutorials, there's, there's probably about a half a dozen to a dozen different tutorials on there. Um, if you'd like to be a, a notified of our, of any sort of announcements specific to, uh, uh, refinement, uh, certainly go visit that, uh, that link right there. And that'll, that'll tell you what that is, uh, or excuse me, that'll allow you to, to, uh, um, to, to, to sign on to the list. And then we would then announce if we have an update that's going to be available through SB Grid that would appear there. And then finally, if it's commercial licenses, uh, anyone's doing commercial development, those are available there. So just a few key uh, conclusions. Uh, I've made it pretty clear, I think, that we plugged this into Phoenix. Uh, we have tested with the most current version of Phoenix. Uh, it should also work with any uh, thanks to the, the work that uh, uh, that Phoenix has, has done with Nigel and, uh, and and Paul and so on and so forth. They they actually have this as part of their their build system, and so uh, any Phoenix should actually support this. Um, anything that even the newer st or anything that's newer nightly builds or so on and so forth, it should will work just fine right out of the box. Uh, the plugin is now available through SB Grid, um, of course, obviously. Um, and then we, we we already talked about that we're leading to lower ligand strain, improved understanding of interactions. Um, we've compared back to neutron diffraction and still seen a, a good bit of information that we're able to get out of this information. Um, and then, and something I didn't really talk about a lot, at, at all, um, but it will be coming out very soon in terms of papers. And also, if you were at the uh, the GRC a few a few months ago, the uh, CompChem GRC, you had seen my talk on that. Um, and that is we're actually being able to score these protonation and flip states and so on and so forth. And so, if you're interested in that certainly follow up with me, uh, email me either directly or that support line. And then finally, just a few key thank yous. Uh, certainly my, my uh, Chris Lagerfer that, that has done a whole lot of the, uh, the, the, the key um, validations of the method. Uh, he was the first author on the paper uh, that came out last year on this method. Um, you know, as, as, which uh, has been really crucial for that. Of course, a couple of, a couple of my other uh, developers have also been involved. Um, good number of collaborators, and I already mentioned, of course, the Phoenix folks. 
um, who have who have given us our ble their blessing and have uh, certainly have been a big help along the way. Uh, NIH uh, could couldn't do a whole lot without them in the early days, uh, where we of course got uh, some funding from the uh, SBIR program. Thank you for your time, and uh, and if you have any questions, I'm all ears. Great, thank you very much, Lance. Um, for those uh, online, if you want to send me, if you have questions, you can send them to me by chat, and I will relay them uh, to Lance. Um, I just want to announce uh, the DivCon software is available at some sites now. The distribution is ongoing. If you, uh, for those on the call now who uh, would like me to bump them up in the queue for uh, distribution, send me an email at bugs at SPGrid, and I can give sites priority if you'd like me to. Otherwise, it should be available uh, everywhere globally today. So we do have one question here in the room, so hold, I'm going to pass the mic here. Uh, actually, we have two questions in the room. So the, the first one would be, you've mentioned scaling and sizes. So is there a rough upper upper bound that you guys have for number of atoms in the QM region? Oh, that's that's, that's a really great question because it kind of surprises people, I think, when we say our, our, our test system, so our nightly test system, uh, is actually a built-up molecule that has about a million atoms in it. Um, so the, so the, so the, 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 uh, the method itself will run, uh, and that that'll run within you know gigabytes of memory. So it, it will actually run uh, pretty much any size that I think anybody is going to run into. On the structures that we run on a on a we'll say a regular basis for real life, uh, you know if you have you know tens of thousands of atoms, you're 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 going to be fine. Um, you know if you if, in terms of your QM region that you really want to run, if you're if you're trying to turn this turn the crank quicker. Uh, you know, at that point, then a few thousand atoms is probably your best bet. But you're probably not going to ever run into a limit, um, you know, a hard limit. You're, of course, going to run into the limits of reality of, well, these things are going to take a long time to run um, if you're going to run a million atoms. Okay. Thank you. Um, does, that, does, that, does that answer your question? I know it's a really t it's a tough answer because it is, it is complicated. It's one of those things that it really does. It just depends upon how big you want to run. But it will yeah, be able to, right. to definitely run the question. And yeah, the bigger it is, the longer it's going to go. I was just that's curious. that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. Yep. Then that sounds like it's reasonable. So thank you. Yep. And yep. I guess my second question is more speculative and it's inspired by your figure that showed changes in, in the difference density. So do you have any plans to extend extend the QM region to scattering factors and the structure factor that's being used for difference Fourier outputs? Uh, that's a. I mean, that's a would be a good question too. Uh, you know, at least at this stage, um, you know, we we're really. I, I mean, I would say we we've gone through and we most of the work that we've done has been again just using density straight up. You know, with, again within within Phoenix, um, that has been you know extremely effective. Uh, what we have done then too, as kind of like a follow up, or or I guess you could say post scoring, and that would be in a case where you would use difference density to just tell you is this correct or not. Uh, we haven't really used that concept within refinement per se, but we have used it to look at after the fact. Uh, you know, is it some is this a better um, uh, fit or not? And so for that, we've used uh, I think I mentioned earlier uh, Ian's Tickle's uh, Z score of the difference density method, and that tends to work much much better than real space correlation coefficient. But that's more of a grading process, not as a refinement. But when you're doing those comparisons, the, the calculated amplitudes, are those still coming from conventional scattering factors or are those coming from some sort of QM modified scattering factors? No, no, it's it's all straight from, uh, uh, in that case, straight from Phoenix. So no, we're, we don't do any manipulation of the scattering factors after the fact. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. I mean, I would assume that there'd be impact because we have, you know, the model's different. You know, the model, of course, is a QM model, but we don't actually impact it in any way. We don't optimize them in any way. We don't we do not do anything else beyond that. So I guess you could say it's an indirect, probably. We have one more from here in the group. Hi, Lance. I also have two quick questions. The first one is, have you been able to benchmark this against, uh, say, an experimental data set of ligand binding energies? And are you more successful yeah. at predicting those binding energies? <laughs> That's a great question. question. The question of uh, have we been able to yet? Uh, yes, um, and uh, we are. We're actually putting together a paper on that topic as we speak. So yes, that is something that 
uh, really, you know, it's kind of like the, the next obvious step in this whole thing of, well, it's great that you're getting better structure, but, and it's great that you're capturing these interactions better, but are you actually, you know, uh, being able to, to now impact computational chemistry or prediction down the road? Um, and so, yes, we have, uh, don't really have a whole lot of data to talk about yet, uh, but I just, I'd suspect that, that would be in the next, uh, probably the next couple of months. Okay, fair enough. Uh, my second question is about dynamics, and dynamics can be very important in ligand binding and enzymology. Is there any readout in this method that might give an idea about any degree of dynamics within the system? I'm not sure if this answers your question, but what, uh, you know, off the top of my head, the, the one way to think about it would be if you ran a uh, normal mode or frequency calculation, um, find out then, you know, do you, are all of your uh, uh, frequencies real? Um, you know, are they all, you know, correct <laughs> as it were, uh, at least that's going to tell you whether or not you have the, you know, a, a good lower energy structure. Um, that's a very, very indirect though. I mean, that's not really going to your question. I don't, I, I don't really, I, I would, I, so I would say then the short answer is no, not really. There isn't anything that we have in here that would, other than a frequency calculation, which may give you some impact or some understanding, um, it's not going to be something that's going to be directly attributable to uh, uh, to start any sort of MD. Now, you could, of course, run MD, and one of the things that actually we've explored, have not really done a lot of yet, um, this would be interesting too, uh, going back to the sampling point, of uh, if you want to do a simulated annealing or something along those lines, uh, presumably you could do that within Phoenix. Um, uh, but no, I, we don't really have anything, that, you know, off the top of my head that would really work for that to answer your question. All right, great. <clears throat> so we have um, a few questions from the group uh, online. Here's one. Um, so a practical question. Uh, which, when should someone switch on uh, DivCon refinement? Right at the beginning of the refinement or when the refinement is also almost complete? Uh, right in the middle, actually. So, so when it, when a refinement or when any structure work is initially being done, uh, you know, right immediately after model building, you're generally going to have a lot of major hot spots, right? There, these these are structures that you know you're going to have, you know, bad clashes. Uh, you know, you're going to have, you know, potentially atoms going through other atoms. I mean, it can look really bad when you first get started. You want to try to take care of those problems, um, and conventional refinement is great for that because it's because you've already you said it. Here's a bunch of restraints. Allow it to to to, to minimize down at least to a point. And the reason being is that uh, it's actually twofold. One is uh, if something's a hot spot, QM is tends to be pretty sensitive to that anyway. If it's really 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 bad, uh, it, it it'll run and it'll convert it'll probably converge, um, especially with our methods. Um, but it will take a long, 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 long time to do it. And so if you, uh, so that, so that, that's the, that would be the, the first problem or the first case then is really try to then optimize it down to some, some level that at least is a good start. The other issue that, that tends to come up is that we're using a, a what's called perception or a concept of perception within the method. And so when a structure first comes in, it's looked at, it's perceived. The, chem the basic chemistry is perceived within that structure to say, if, actually, if basically, what is the total charge of the QM, the QM region, the total formal charge? And so one of the things we've seen, uh, people have, have um, when they're trying to play around with it and see what happens, is they've actually tried to like break a macrocycle, for example, and see if it comes back together again. Yeah, you because know, conceptually they think, well, okay, if I broke it, it should come back together. And what happens is, it now is such a bad structure. It's a it's a uh, it's an artificially bad structure in this case. That what happened was we did a couple things. We we perceived that structure, and we've now calculated the stru the, the, the the charge wrong. And on top of that, the method is are also seen that there's missing that, that there's a dangling bond. There's a missing pr a proton there, or what it thinks to be a missing proton. It can't read your mind. And so what it did is also filled in a proton just to make sure that uh, that the valences were fully satisfied. And in so doing, that the, that that uh, uh, macrocycle will never come back back together again. And that's the way it should work in this case. And so to, so back to the question, back to the point is. Uh, somewhere right in the middle, you've now taken you to the point where you've taken care of the, um, you know, those major hot spots. You've made sure that the chemistry at least is somewhere close, and now you now you flip on the QM uh, before you go too far down the path 
where you're you've made so many a priori assumptions that now you've broken it in in some way that the QM can't really pull it out without spending a lot more time or a lot more effort. Here's two uh, two sort of development questions for the software itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Any chance of getting the DivCon uh, in the Phoenix GUI, and uh, do you have a uh, time frame on uh, a Mac version? Okay, so the first question, uh, great question. We actually have been talking to Nigel about that that very question. Uh, the the uh, and actually, at the, if anybody was at the ACA um, in Philadelphia a few months, or yeah, I guess it was a couple months ago now, uh, we were talking to Nigel about this very specific thing, or where the issue has been that they don't have a really great way to feed in or read in, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, and, and then now build up the GUI based upon exterior, exteriorly re, uh, provided uh, components or, or uh, parameters. Instead, what happens if you do a search for the parameters? Actually, it will find it. If you have, if you do a search for QB um, within the search tool within uh, within Phoenix's GUI, it actually finds them just fine. You can choose them. You should be able to manipulate them. You should be able to pick them. Uh, but it's not, it's not fully integrated. It's not what we want to see, and it's not what Nigel wants to see either. So what he told me at that time was that they're looking at it. Um, that is something that they've run into as well, uh, not just with us, but with some other tools. And so they are trying to look at how to generalize this and make it a little bit better, a little bit easier. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to come up with a way to at least provide, um, you know, whether it be a patched version or something like that, that we can just say, well, here it is. You, know, you guys can, can run with it. So that, that answer, I think, answers the, the, the one question. Uh, in terms of timeframes for that, uh, we're, you're probably looking at, uh, you know, hopefully later on this year would be my would be my hope. But, you know, again, part of it's dependent upon uh, on Nigel's end as well. Uh, in terms of the Mo package, we actually already have a Mo build in, interior in, inside or or in, internally. Um, we are exploring it right now, making sure that everything works. Um, that could be any time. You know, that could be any time in the next few weeks. So I have uh, two sort of related questions here. Um, could you talk a little bit about how uh, DivCon plays with or works with the, uh, the X-ray stereochemistry and X-ray uh, weights in Phoenix Refine and maybe where simulated annealing would fall into the continuum there between um, refinement and DivCon? Okay, yeah. So, the, so in terms of weights, um, if, if what, as it's so, so effectively what's going on is it's reading in the uh, set of gradients, the, the weights that are within um, – are are just are basically calculated using the the standard Phoenix, um, I guess weighting uh, schemes that, that are already in there. So we don't manipulate those directly. Uh, we do have a set of weights, however, that try to weight uh, in relation or or between uh, the the QM gradients because of course there's there's th those gradients are on a different scale than the stereochemical restraint gradients. And so there is a weighting scheme that goes into there. Um, off the top of my head, and again, I can, I can dig down a little bit deeper, but off the top of my head, I believe we settled on uh, basically just a normalizing factor that normalizes between those two. And we, we um, yeah, again, that's something I can dig up a little bit better for you if you, you know, a little more information. Um, but the actual weighting scheme that's overall doesn't change. We don't manipulate that in any way. What was the, the other question? Uh, where oh. simulated annealing would sort of fit in the continuum there between... Right. So simulated annealing, we haven't really done a whole lot with yet. Uh, it, presumably, that should work very similarly, though. It should go out uh, go out and get our gradients instead of the stereochemical restraint gradients, and you should be able to do it just fine. We've just never done it. Great. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much, Lance, and I'll follow up with you offline. Yep, and thank you guys too. I really appreciate uh, everything that uh, SB Grid's done done with us, and uh, and uh, certainly a thanks for uh, sticking around in terms of this this call. And uh, if you have any questions, certainly re reach out to me, and I'll be happy to help you. Take care. All right. Thanks.